Most of us manage to use some kind of non-prescription drugs, caffeine, alcohol, and painkillers, for example, in moderation, without disrupting our lives. But some of us develop a self-harming substance use disorder. So what a substance use disorder is, is it's continued substance craving and use despite significant life disruption and or risk. So people with these disorders have trouble completing schoolwork, maintaining healthy relationships, or holding a job. They may be unable to care for their children, and they may drive dangerously or lose control of machinery while under the influence. During the course of this lesson, I hope that you can learn the following. What are substance use disorders, and what role do tolerance, withdrawal, and addiction play in these disorders? How do depressants influence neural activity and behavior? How do the major stimulants affect neural activity and behavior? And what biological, psychological, and social cultural factors help explain why some people abuse mind-altering drugs? So first we'll talk about psychoactive drugs. Psychoactive drugs are chemicals that change perception and mood. A drug's overall effect depends not only on its biological effect, but also on the psychology of the user's expectations. And this varies from culture to culture. If one culture assumes that a particular drug produces good feelings or aggression or sexual arousal and another does not, each culture may find its expectations fulfilled. So during the course of this lesson, we're going to be talking about um, the potential abuse, use and abuse of these drugs that can be very dangerous. So a person may be diagnosed with substance use disorder when drug use continues despite significant life disruption, resulting in a brain pathway changes that may persist after quitting the use of the substance. This will lead to strong cravings. With people in situations that trigger memories or drug use, the cravings will be significantly larger or more intense. However, this changes from mild, like two or three symptoms, to moderate, which would include four to five symptoms, and severe, which would include like six symptoms. So these are these um, things that I'm putting on the PowerPoint right now are symptoms of drug use disorder. So first we have impaired control. It uses more substance for longer than intended, so they, can't con they lose control of their use. Tries unsuccessfully to regulate substance use. Spends much time gaining, using, or recovering from substance abuse or craves the substance. There's also social impairment. So the use disrupts obligations at work, school, or home. It continued use despite social problems. It causes reduced social, recreational, and work activities. Risky use. It continues, they continue the use despite the hazards. Continues use despite worsening physical or psychological problems. And then finally, drug action. Experiment experiences tolerance, which means they need more for the desired effect, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And experiences withdrawal when attempting to end use. All of these are, are definite, um, these are actually symptoms of a drug disorder. So impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and drug action. Why might a person who rarely drinks alcohol get buzzed on one can of beer while a long-term drinker shows few effects until the second six-pack? The answer is tolerance. With continued use of alcohol and some other drugs, marijuana is an exception to this, the user's brain chemistry adapts to offset the drug's effect. To experience the same result, the user needs to take larger and larger doses of the substance. Ever-increasing doses of most psychoactive drugs can pose a serious threat to health. In some cases, they lead to addiction. The person craves and uses the substance despite the harmful consequences when we have an addiction. Sometimes, even behaviors become compulsive and dysfunctional. Much like abusive drug taking, 
So the DSM-5 now includes behavioral addictions such as gambling disorder and hoarding disorder and proposes internet gambling disorder for further study. Those with addictions often try to fight them, but abruptly stopping the drug or behavior can lead to an undesirable effects of withdrawal. So this is heavy, like a big discomfort and stress that follows um, continuing and um, that follow discontinuing an addictive drug or behavior. So as soon as we stop, our body goes through this withdrawal symptoms. So heavy drinker, coffee drinkers that skip their usual caffeine, know the feeling when a headache of, or grogginess st strikes. Three major categories of psychoactive drugs are depressants, stimulants, and hallucinogens. They all work at the brain synapses. They stimulate, inhibit, or mimic the activity of the brain's own chemical messengers or the neurotransmitters. So let's first talk about depressants. Depressants, we have alcohol, barbiturates, and opiates are the ones we'll be talking about. Okay, these, um, these drugs, they actually... Um, they actually calm or depress neural activity and, f and slow bodily functions. So let's talk a little bit about alcohol first. Now, in, is it true that in large amounts alcohol is a depressant, but in small amounts it's a stimulant? False. Even low doses of alcohol may, even, may indeed enliven a drinker, but they do so by activating as a disinhibitor, or they slow the brain activity that controls judgments and inhibitions. So it's slowing things down. It, uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about um, the effects of depressants on the body. First, unleasing urges. Alcohol is an equal opportunity drug. It increases helpful attendances as when tipsy restaurant patrons will leave big tips. And it increases harmful tendencies like sexual aggressive college men knowing that beauty is in the eyes of the beer holder. Many lower their dates inhibitions by getting them to drink. Each year, drinking has contributed to some 1,400 deaths, 70,000 sexual assaults, and 500,000 injuries of U.S. college students. Also, it slows neural processing. Low doses of alcohol relax the drinker by slowing sympathetic nervous system activity. Larger doses cause reactions to slow, speech to slur, and skilled performance to, to deteriorate. Paired with lack of sleep, alcohol is a potent sedative. Add these physical effects to lowered inhibitions, and the result can be deadly. Worldwide, several hundred thousand lives are lost each year in alcohol-related accidents and violent crime. Memory Disruption so a uh, memory, some, some people for, um, drink to forget their troubles and forget they do. Alcohol disrupts the processing of recent experiences into the long-term memories. So heavy drinkers may not recall people that they met the night before uh, or what they said or what they did while they were drunk. These blackouts result in part because alcohol suppresses REM sleep. This is the part of the sleep cycle that helps fix the day's experiences into permanent memories. Also, um, it affects our expectations. As with other psychoactive drugs, alcohol users' expectations influence their behavior. When people believe that alcohol affects social behavior in certain ways and believe rightly or wrongly that they have been drinking al alcohol, they will behave accordingly. That's just the way it goes. So now I would like to have you sh see a clip, a small clip. It talks about and shows the effects of alcohol on our reactions and how it changes our perceptions as well. It takes about two minutes until alcohol reaches the brain. It spreads out and affects almost all areas of the brain at once, just like fireworks. 
The ethanol molecules can attach to many different receptors, changing the course of action in the brain. In the reward system, alcohol releases neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, and endorphin. Everybody is familiar with the effect, feeling adventurous, happy, but sometimes also aggressive. Alcohol not only amplifies, but also changes the transmission of impulses, such as the glutamate system, which regulates brain activity. Ethanol molecules attach to the glutamate receptors, paralyzing them. The result is a slowing down of brain activity. This affects the reward system, less neurotransmitters. The euphoria dwindles, impaired vision sets in. It becomes difficult to estimate distances and reflexes slow, especially with red signals. Alcohol alters another function of another common regulator in the brain, the GABA, gamma-aminobutyric acid system. GABA molecules slow down brain activity. This damping action increases when ethanol molecules attach to the GABA receptors. Here too, alcohol slows down brain activity. All these changes make it harder to speak and think. Articulation becomes unclear, thought processes uninhibited, and conversations incoherent. Alcohol distorts the brain's natural balance. The more you drink, the more inactive the brain becomes. Brain performance continuously diminishes. The entire body is affected. Vision, speech, movement, even memory. When the dose gets too high, the brain switches off. Blackout. In those with alcohol use disorder, prolonged and excessive drinking can shrink the brain. Women are especially vulnerable because they have less of stomach enzyme to digest the alcohol. A strong correlation between early drinking and later addiction appeared in a national survey of about 43,000 adults. Of those who began drinking alcohol before the age of 14, about half, or 47%, um, later became addicted. Of those who began drinking at age 21 or after, only 9% showed addiction. And this, and so this is a really important uh, this is really important for us to remember in trying to prevent um, teenage alcoholism and teenage drinking. More likely to, to become an alcoholic or have alcohol use disorder if you begin drinking at a young age. So alcohol use disorder is um, the alcohol use is marked by tolerance, withdrawal, and a drive to continue the problematic use. You have to drink more and more to get the desired effect, and you have symptoms of withdrawal um, when you do not have that drink. So let's switch gears to barbiturates. Like alcohol, barbiturate uh, drugs are tranquilizers. They depress the nervous system activity. Barbiturates can um, sometimes induce sleep or reduce anxiety if they're prescribed by a doctor. But in larger doses, they can impair memory and judgment. If combined with alcohol, the total depressive effect on the body functions can often lead to death. When you have you know, tranquilizers or barbiturates teamed with alcohol, it's just too much for our body. So these are drugs that depress the activity of the central nervous system. They reduce anxiety but impairing the memory and judgment as well. So opiates, opium and its offshoots such as heroin also depress the nervous system activity. So um, as blissful pleasure replaces pain and anxiety, the user's pupils constrict when they use 
opiates and the breathing slows down and lethargy. This is a feeling of extreme relax relaxation and a lack of energy. It sets in. For this short-term pleasure, the person may pay a long-term price. A gnawing craving for another fix, a need for progressively larger doses, tolerance will develop, and the extreme discomfort of withdrawal. When repeatedly flooded with artificial opiate, the brain eventually stops producing endorphins. This is its own feel-good opiates that our body naturally produces that keep us happy and help, help calm us. If the artificial opiate is then withdrawn, the brain lacks the normal level of these na natural painkillers that our body needs. Those who cannot choose or do not choose to endure this state may pay the ultimate price, and that's usually death by overdose. So stimulants such as caffeine, nicot caffeine nicotine, amphetamines, cocaine, ecstasy, and methamphetamines. Um, these a stimulant excites the neural activity and speeds up body functions. It pupils dilate, heart and breathing rates increase, blood sugar level rises, causing a drop in appetite. Energy and self-confidence also rises. So stimulants um, in include caffeine, nic nicotine, and amphetamines, cocaine and methamphetamine, and ecstasy, and the people use stimulants to feel alert, to lose weight, or to boost their mood or athletic performance. Unfortunately, stimulants can be addictive. And as you may know, if you are one of the many who's use who use caffeine daily in your coffee, tea, soda, or energy drinks, cut off from your, us your usual dose may you may crash into fatigue, headaches, irritability, irritability, and also maybe even depression. Um, now, nicotine is one of the most addictive stimulants. It's found in cigarettes and other tobacco products. Um, are ta tobacco products at least as addictive as heroin and cocaine? The answer is yes. Attempts to quit even within the first three weeks of smoking often um, often fail. And as with other addictions, smokers develop tolerance. If you are a smoker who has tried unsuccessfully to kick your habit, you probably aren't surprised. Addicted customers are loyal customers. Nearly one billion of them will be rewarded for their loyalty with a tobacco-related death. A burning cigarette is a portable nicotine dispenser. Within seven seconds, this is twice as fast as intravenous heroin, a rush of nicotine signals the central nervous system, and it releases a flood of neurotransmitters. Okay, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and diminish the appetite and boosts alertness and mental efficiency. The dopamine um, calms anxiety and reduces sensitivity to pain. So this is great. However, um, after a while, you can't get these same feelings after you quit smoking. The artificial, um, the artificial chemicals that you're getting into your body, nicotine, um, are providing that. And so after you quit, you're going to suffer from withdrawals. And that's why, and it's so difficult, that's why it's only about 10% um, a lot of people have a really difficult time stopping smoking after they become a, um, addicted to nicotine. So tobacco product products are at least addictive as heroin. So cocaine users travel a fast track from flying high to crashing to earth. And here we have a little diagram that kind of shows um, what cocaine does with our neurotransmitters. Dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine drops off when we use it and within a mere 15 to 30 seconds a crash of agitated depression follows. Many regular cocaine users um, chasing this high, they become addicted. In the lab, cocaine addicted monkeys have pressed levers more than 12,000 times to gain one cocaine injection. Cocaine addicted adults likewise may take extreme action, including crime, to gain more dosage.
Okay, so um, cocaine's psychological effects depends in part on the dosage and the form consumed, but the situation and the user's expectations and personality also play a role. Given a placebo, placebo cocaine users who thought they were taking cocaine often had cocaine-like experiences. The highly addictive methamphetamine triggers the release of neurotransmitter dopamine, which stimulates brain cells that enhance energy and mood. Eight or so hours of heightened energy and mood then follow. The after effects may include irritability, insomnia, high blood pressure, seizures, periods of disorientation, and occasional violent behavior. Over time, methamphetamine users appear permanently use appears to permanently reduce the brain's normal output of dopamine. So ecstasy is the street name um, for MDMA. And this powerful drug is both a stimulant and a mild hallucinogen. So they, the hallucinogens are what distort our perception and lead to false sensory images. Um, ecstasy is an amphetamine, a derivative that triggers the brain's release of dopamine. But its major effect is releasing stored serotonin and blocking its reuptake. This prolongs the serotonin's, serotonin's feel-good flood. Users feel the effect about a half hour after taking the ecstasy pill. For three or four hours, they experience high energy and emotional elevation. They feel intimately connected to people around them. Kind of a I love everyone feeling. So the ecstasy interferes with all of our functions, our neurotransmission. It's the decrease in serotonin output that's the problem. It can be permanent and it can lead to a permanently depressed mood. Ecstasy delights for the night but the darkness is for tomorrow is basically how it works. Among the least addictive drugs are hallucinogens. These substances distort perception and call up sensory images such as sounds or sights without any input from the senses. This help explains why these drugs are also called psychedelic, meaning mind manifesting. Some are synthetic. The best known synthetic hallucinogen is um, hallucinogens are ecstasy. Um, this is discussed earlier, and we have also LSD. Others, such as mild hallucinogen marijuana, are natural substances. So people under the influence of hallucinogenic drugs see hallucinations, things that aren't really there, or report a light in the center of a field of vision, almost like a near-death experience is what some people have said. Okay, so LSD like ecstasy, interferes with the serotonin neurotransmitter system. An LSD trip can take users to unexpected places. Emotions may vary from euphoric to detachment to panic, depending in part on the person's current mood and expectations. Even so, the perceptual distortions and, and hallucinations have something in common, whether provoked to hallucinate by drugs loss of oxygen or extreme sensory de deprivation, the brain hallucinates in basically the same way. The experience typically begins with simple geometric forms such as a crisscross or cobweb or a spiral. The next phase consists of more meaningful images. Some may be in front of a tunnel, others may, re may be replays of past emotional experiences. As the hallucination peaks, users frequently feel separated from their bodies. Dreamlike scenes see so, seem so real that people may, may become panic-stricken or even harm themselves. Marijuana. For 5,000 years, hemp has been cultivated for its fiber. The leaves and flowers of this plant, which are sold as marijuana, contain a chemical. Uh, this chemical... <clears throat> Um, it actually makes marijuana difficult to classify, a difficult drug to classify, whether smoked, which gets it to the brain in only like seven seconds, or eaten, this is produces um, a less and a slower effect. 
This chemical in it produces a mix of effects. Marijuana is a mild hallucinogen, increasing sensitivity to colors, sounds, tastes, and smells. But like alcohol, marijuana also relaxes, disinhibits, and may produce a euphoric high. Both drugs impair the motor coordination, perceptual skills, and the reaction time necessary for safe, safely operating an automobile or other machinery. So here is um, a nice table of the psychoactive drugs, some of the ones that we've talked about. Um, you can look over it for a minute. It's a very interesting table, actually. It, it gives us the pleasurable effects, the reason why people want to take this drugs. And then also on the, on the next column, it talks about the negative effects, which as you can see, even with the words, they out, it highly outweighs the pleasurable effects. And the long-term effects of all of these drugs are, can be deadly. So this table is going, to uh, is going to summarize the psychoactive drugs discussed in this section. They share some features. All trigger negative uh, after effects that counter the drug's immediate positive effects. So as the negative effects grow stronger with rep repetition, larger and larger doses are typically needed to produce the desired positive effect. So this is the process of tolerance. There, there is increasingly larger doses are needed to produce um, even worse after effects. Okay, and so there, this is going to be the withdrawal symptoms that will be even worse. The worsening after effects will create a needed switch to, um, to switch off the withdrawal symptoms by taking yet another hit of the drug. And so this process is the process of addiction. Are some of us biologically vulnerable to particular drugs? The evidence that we have indicates that we are. So here's some of the evidence. Having an identical twin with alcohol use disorder puts one at increased risk for alcohol problems. In marijuana use also, identical twins are more closely resemble each other. This increased risk, however, is not found among fraternal twins. We also have boys who are at age boys that are at age six are excitable, impulsive, and fearless, which is genetically influenced traits. They are more likely as teens to smoke, drink, and abuse other drugs. And some genes are more common among people and animals predisposed to alcohol use disorder. And researchers are seeking genes that contribute to tobacco addiction. These genes may, for example, produce deficiencies in the brain's natural dopamine reward system. All right, so very quickly, before we talk about how can substance abuse and addiction among young people be prevented, we've learned about, um, throughout this whole course, biological um, psychological and social cultural influence all interact to influence behavior. So that's the same way it's also true with addictive disorders, especially um, substance abuse disorders. Feelings that one li one's life is meaningless and directionless is a psychological influence that puts youth and young adults at risk. This feeling is common among school drop dropouts who try to make their way in life without job skills, without privilege, and with little hope. Sometimes, the psychological influence is obvious. Many heavy users of alcohol, marijuana, and cocaine have experienced significant stress or failure and are depressed. Girls with a history of depression, eating disorders, or sexual or physical abuse are at risk for substance addiction. And so are youth undergoing school or neighborhood transitions. By temporarily dulling the pain of self-awareness, Psychoactive drugs may offer a way to avoid coping with depressed, depression, anger, anxiety, or even insomnia. So, for substance use, location matters, and those with whose genetic predisposition nudges them towards substance use, they will find more opportunities and less supervision in cities. And so, um, relatively drug-free small towns and rural areas often have restraints or more in substance abuse. When it's available, they're going to use it more often. Regardless of the location, peers influence drug-related attitudes and opportunities. Peers 
to roll the parties and provide or don't provide the drugs. If adolescents' friends use drugs, the odds are that he or she will too. If the friends do not, the opportunity may not even arise. So now that we've covered this, let's move on to um, the last thing that we're going to be talking about. How can substance use disorder um, use addiction among people, young people in particular, uh, be prevented? So teens rarely abuse drugs if they understand the physical and psychological costs. Um, so do well in school, they feel good about themselves, and are peer, have a peer group that disapproves of, of early drinking and using drugs. These all contribute. So these findings suggest three tactics for preventing and treating substance use and addiction among young people. First, educate people about the long-term costs of a, drug temp a drug's temporary pleasures. Boost people's self-esteem and purpose in life. And modify peer associations or inoculate youth against peer pressure by training them in refusal skills.